Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, and welcome to our uh, hydrogen and fuel cell supergen event on progress and future challenges in hydrogen and fuel cell research towards net zero. It's a great pleasure to have uh, you here with us today and to welcome our panel of um, supergen alumni uh, and uh, folk who've been working on this program, associated programs for such a long time. Um, next slide, please. My name is Nigel Brandon. I'm a director of the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Supergen Hub um, and will uh, just make a few comments to you, uh, opening comments. Before I do so, kind of on a housekeeping front, um, everyone here is on mute unless you're a speaker. Um, so uh, if you need or wish to ask any questions, um, please post them through the uh, chat function and the Q&A function and we can bring those forward and the, the, the panel chairs can do so um, following the talks. Um, if all, all the talks today will be recorded and they'll all be available to watch on our YouTube channel later. Um, we have some hashtags there, hashtag Hydrogen UK and hashtag COP26 Supergen, which you're very welcome and encouraged to use. Um, so let's uh, let me move on. <coughs> Thank you. You'll see in a moment that the, the Supergen investments in this space have been running for some time, 18 years now. It's a long time. The first Supergen investments in the hydrogen field were made in 2003. And for those of us who've been working in this area for that time, you've certainly seen some um, ups and downs, some waves of enthusiasm, um, some troughs of um, lack of enthusiasm, and actually now a recognition that this is indeed a very important area for the transition to net zero. Um, and I think that's, uh, it's great to see. Um, uh, I don't think there's, in, in, at least in my view, there's, we, there's never been more interest or more recognition around the, uh, importance of low carbon energy carriers such as hydrogen uh, and uh, other uh, carriers such as ammonia that can be coupled with it or indeed with conversion technologies that can utilize those low carbon carriers and turn them back into power for example such as a fuel cell and um, so coupled with the interest in hydrogen there is growing interest in fuel cell technology and as that technology continues to mature the sector shipped 1.4 gigawatts of product last year to customers and so this is um, becoming increasing an increasingly important part of the energy landscape of course we are approaching cop 26 hosted here in the uk this year and the uk's hydrogen strategy is also expected to be issued shortly so it's a very good time to reflect on the impact of over 50 million pounds of investment that um, UKRI have made through the through EPSRC into the supergen uh, supergens relating to hydrogen and relating to fuel cells, and to ask our panel to reflect on the future of the sector from their perspective. So we're looking forward to the day today. <clears throat> Thank you. Th this is a little picture of the uh, landscape, um, and going from left to right. Uh, and there's been a range of supergens funded in this space. And we are trying to represent today through our uh, panelists, all of whom are alumni of these programs or have been associated as industri key industrial partners of these programs uh, uh, th throughout, throughout this journey. If we look on the far left, you'll see that the first investment in this space, the UK Sustainable Hydrogen Energy Consortium and this UK SHEC, PI of which was Professor Tim Mays, who's um, with us today, of course. Uh, and um, then we had uh, alongside that the first of the Supergen Fuel Cell Consortium. There were two actually. Uh, Keith Scott was the PI of the first one, and then I was the PI of the uh, second one. We also have the delivery of sustainable hydrogen Supergen, which Ian Metcalf was the uh, PI of. In those days, supergens were somewhat different. They were very much more research oriented and there was a consortium put together where people worked together entirely on a kind of research focus. Uh, when we got to late 2012 or into 2012, there was a decision to kind of restructure what a supergen was. Uh, and the hydrogen and fuel cell supergen hub, which we are speaking through today, 
was was put together and really bringing together the three different. Sorry, if you could go back a slide. Was put together, bringing together the three different um, aspects of the pri previous supergens around hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, and hydrogen conversion in fuel cells. Um, uh, and so that's that's the program we're we're focusing on now. You can see that that has represented a total of 20 million, 21 million pounds of investment, uh, not only in the hub, uh, which uh, has a core research element, but also an important element in building networks and communities and integrating the different areas together and integrating at academia with industry. Uh, but there's also been a number of directed programs which have been funded and linked to the hub and they have noted there around hydrogen and fuel cells and an international partnership with, with um, South Korea. Uh, in addition, there's been some really important uh, enabling investments in PhD training through the Centers for Doctoral Training um, in hydrogen fuel cells and their applications led out of the University of Birmingham, and then the follow on to that also led out of the University of Birmingham. And then more recently, the Sustainable Hydrogen Center led out of the University of Nottingham. So that's the landscape. And it's been an 18 year journey, and we hope very much that we'll hear from um, our colleagues today about their thoughts on that and, and their, in particular their thoughts for the future. OK, next slide, please. So the hub itself, uh, what, what's its remit? Um, uh, it's a little bit different from the original Supergens. It's got a broader remit, obviously, to do research, and there is a core element of research uh, involved. Uh, but also to look at community building and translation and advocacy for hydrogen and fuel cells and to help build networks and communities in the space. And today's meeting forms part of that broader objective. Next slide, please. Um, we're very grateful for our uh, industry partners who sit on our advisory board. And in a moment, we'll hear from Sue Ellis, who's chair of that um, industrial advisory board. And then we have a management board of the of the lead academic partners. You'll see on the left there the, the breadth of work that we undertake. Um, and just to pick on some of that, we have a program of work on polymer electrolyte fuel cells, of which the lead is Anthony Kusinak at Imperial College, a program on hydrogen storage, which is jointly led by Tim Mays at Bath, David Book at Birmingham, uh, a piece on hydrogen production, which is led by Ian Metcalf, Newcastle. Piece on education and training led by Robert Steinberger Wilkins at Birmingham. Hydrogen and fuel cell systems led by Hilay Shah at Imperial College, and hydrogen and fuel cell safety led by Vladimir Molkov at Ulster. A solid oxide, fuel cells and electrolyzers, which is led by John Irvin at St Andrews, and policy and social economics, which is led by Paul Dodds at UCL. Um, and then, in principle, I'm in charge of the research synthesis piece, which means I'm in charge of whatever that means. Uh, but it's an attempt, of course, to try and pull the whole thing together. Uh, and we're really in, uh, supported in this, and it's really vital by uh, Zara Kadir and Marina Longberg, who are also helping to drive this event, who keep us all on the straight and narrow and, and run the whole show. Uh, next slide, please. And so those are the core hub universities that I've just mentioned. But in terms of projects, there's been a much wider range of uh, academic partners, uh, which is great to see. And we've had a number of international universities linked into projects and programs, which is also very good to see. Uh, next slide, please. So if we look at um, you know, the, the, the period of output from the uh, hydrogen and fuel cell supergen hub phase of this journey, I think we can be proud of a number of things. Firstly, and I think most importantly, the researchers that have come through this program um, early career researchers uh, and PhD students, of course, who've gone on now to develop no longer early career programs. And we'll hear about from some of our alum who've gone on to very senior roles in academia and, of course, really interesting roles in industry as well. Um, uh, and, and we're very proud of our uh, alumni. Perhaps that's our, our greatest contribution. Um, we value very much the relationships we have with industry and that's a really important part of our uh, op or modus operandi uh, both through the advisory board and more widely 34 different industry partners have collaborated on projects linked to the uh, hub and the supporting programs we've had an active program of conferences workshops 
in hosting international delegations, networking of which today, of course, forms a part. And I think the other area I would really highlight, I think that's been impactful, probably well beyond the budget spent on it, is the other white papers. Um, we certainly felt as a community that we needed to put our voice more strongly in the room with policymakers about the opportunities and benefits that hydrogen and related technologies would bring and that fuel cell uh, technologies would bring at a time when there was much less interest in the space. And indeed, our first white paper there, which was in, uh, launched in 2014 on the role of hydrogen and fuel cell technology in the delivery of low carbon heat, has been widely cited in, in UK uh, national uh, policy discussions. And subsequently, you'll see a range of white papers around energy security, uh, energy systems, economic impacts, um, the opportunities for clean, supporting clean growth, and indeed negative emission hydrogen from biomass, uh, all covered in our, in our white papers. And if you haven't yet had a chance to look at them, they are available from our website. Um, let me also cite the outputs there. We have uh, you know, approaching a thousand members of our network now, uh, uh, many high quality papers, um, uh, patents indeed, as well as the white papers, over 100 PhD students and counting through the CDTs. And we've leveraged close to 50 million pounds of external funding um, across, across hub partners. Next slide, please. So I was at this point to introduce James Tarver to you. James is our EPSRC lead, but unfortunately James is not at all well, so he will not be joining us today. Um, we wish you all the best, James, in, in getting better. Next slide, please. But it is uh, my pleasure to introduce you to introduce Sue Ellis to you. Um, Sue has, uh, chairs our advisory board. We're grateful uh, for her long-term support. Um, Sue has 25 years industrial R&D experience with Johnson Matthey. She studied natural sciences at Cambridge and her master's in surface science and catalysis at Liverpool. And she works on projects across the low carbon space, including catalysis, hydrogen fuel cells, hydrogen storage, carbon capture, uh, recycling and raw materials. So a broad brief, Sue, she's the, the innovation director for JM's efficient natural resources sector, which has a strategic and an innovation and a new product focus. Uh, and so we're grateful for you to join us uh, again today. Um, and let me pass over to you for your comments. Thank you. OK, thanks, Nigel. And it's a pleasure to be here today and a little bit scary to reflect back on, um, you know, the 10 year journey we've been on with the hydrogen fuel cell superjet hub. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so let's think about the journey we've been on in the last year, uh, in the last 10 years. So, you know, Nigel's already talked about the fact that the hydrogen and fuel cell community was struggling to get its message across 10 years ago. It was quite a dispersed community. It's quite difficult um, as a, an outsider, as an industrial partner to know really who, where and how to interact and to engage. And I think the uh, Supergen Hub has done a huge amount of work in pulling together that narrative. And during that time, you know, the world has changed around us. It would be nice to think that the Supergen uh, has also been helping to shape that world. So the narrative on hydrogen has really crisped up um, and hydrogen has moved from being this option in a nice, you know, hydrogen economy, low carbon world to saying in a world where we need to transition to net zero and net zero quickly, hydrogen stops being an option and it's absolutely critical. And those are words that came out from the Committee for Climate Change, saying that hydrogen is no longer an option in a net zero world, it's a necessity. So the speed of which the change has happened is, is quite amazing, really, and quite exciting to those of us who've been working this space for some time. So 60% of global GDP um, is now in countries with net zero policies. Most of those are 2050, China is 2060. And there are more and more hydrogen technology roadmaps being established and they all have different flavours, so it can be quite confusing. Um, some of the policies out of, for example, Australia are about, you know, what's the export opportunity in the UK? It's very much about how do we decarbonise uh, industrial clusters and maximise the, the value to us as, a, as an island that can integrate with the CCS investments. And in other economies, it, it's about applications. 
So there are a lot of projects announced, um, serious money now behind hydrogen fuel cell um, investments. And who would have known 10 years ago that hydrogen had colours? So we talk about blue and green hydrogen. I've heard gold hydrogen, pink hydrogen, orange hydrogen, blue, brown, grey, whatever colour you want. But, you know, we're really beginning to talk about the carbon intensity of our hydrogen and how we can move forward the right solutions and geographies. And I think 10 years ago, the hydrogen discussion was all about fuel cells. Um, and now it's far more about that. It's about managing renewables. It's about decarbonising heat. It's about integrating and enabling e-fuels through carbon capture utilisation. It's about energy infrastructure and transportation around the world. And then with fuel cells, it's about you know, the applications where they complement batteries around heavy duty trucks, buses, long range cars, train ships and aviation. So the conversation has got a lot more mature. It's got a lot grown, more grown up. It's got a lot more sophisticated but it continues to be a difficult and a complex story to tell. So we need to work together to tell that story. If we could go to the next slide. Um, so the Industrial Advisory Board has been there throughout and we're, we're grateful for the work that the Supergen Hub has done in coordinating and connecting and inviting us in to have these discussions. Um, I think one of the strengths of the Advisory Board is that it has involved a range of stakeholders from technology providers to um, some of the research institutes that support this to some of the funding bodies um, through to the industry associations. So we've had great conversations, we've come together as a team, we've tried where possible to support the academics in the Supergen Hub and engage um, and going forward, the only way as we move into the deployment and demonstration phase is to have more collaborations, more discussions and really eke out where the academic and the research community will have huge value in contributing to the deployment of a hydrogen network. So really looking forward to today and um, have a great conference. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Sue. Uh, thank you very much indeed.